from West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for the following is provided by the West Virginia Department of Education and West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Hey! Hey everyone, it's Education Station, the show where we invite teachers from all across West Virginia to submit videos of themselves teaching their favorite lessons. In today's episode, we've got three exciting lessons about history, reading, and health. Well, hello and welcome back, everyone. I'm your host, Alex Milanese, and we're kicking off today's episode with a fun lesson about New World Explorers. So get your history hats on and let's send it over to Ms. Cox. Hi, my name is Leah Cox. I'm from the Nicholas County Career and Technical Center. And today we're going to be doing a world history lesson for fifth grade about New World Explorers. Our first explorer that we're going to talk about is Christopher Columbus. He lived from 1451 to 1506, and he was an Italian trader, explorer, and navigator. In 1492, Columbus landed on an island of the Bahamas, the first European to ever do so. His initial goal was to find a quicker route to Asia and Europe. The second world explorer we'll talk about is Francisco Cornando. He was alive from 1510 to 1554 and was a Spanish explorer. He launched a huge expedition or search party to search the southern parts of the United States for the seven famous cities of gold. Another world explorer we'll talk about is Amerigo Vespucci. He was alive from 1454 to 1512, and he was an Italian merchant, explorer, and cartographer. He was the first person to explain that the new world discovered by Christopher Columbus in 1492 was not the eastern area of Asia. Another New World Explorer we'll talk about is Samuel de Chaplin. He was alive from 1567 to 1635 and was known as the father of New France. He was also the founder of the city Quebec, Canada. Ferdinand Magellan was alive from 1480 to 1521 and led the first expedition to sail all the way around the world. He discovered the passage from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean that today we call the Straits of Magellan. So now we're going to play a little matching game about the New World Explorers that we just learned about. So we're going to take each explorer's name and we're going to match them with what they did. So the first explorer we're going to find is who had the initial goal of finding a quicker route to Asia from Europe. They were also the first European to sail to the Bahamas. The first European to sail all the way to the Bahamas was Christopher Columbus. The next explorer we will find was, is who was the Spanish explorer who launched a huge expedition to the southern part of the US in search of gold of the seven cities of gold. Francisco Cornando was the first Spanish explorer to look for the seven cities of gold. The next explorer we're going to try to find is the person who led the first expedition to sail around the world and discovered the Straits of Magellan. This explorer was Ferdinand Magellan. So next we are going to find who was known as the father of New France. Samuel de Chaplin was known as the new the father of New France. And the final explorer that we're going to find is who explained the new world discovered by Christopher Columbus in 1492 was not e the eastern area of Asia. This explorer was Amerigo Vespucci. All right, so that's all we had for today, and I hope you enjoyed this lesson about new world explorers. Thanks, Ms. Cox. Well, next up, we've got a great story that's going to be read by Miss Gerald. The book is called Nanette's Baguette. Let's check it out. Hi, boys and girls. My name is Lauren Gerald, and I'm here to read to you today Nanette's Baguette. The words and the pictures are by Mo Willems. And what's really interesting about the illustrations in this book is that this was kind of made like a backdrop, like the scenery is all made ahead of time, and then the 
characters are photographed and the words placed into it. So it's a little bit different illustrations than what we've seen before. I hope you enjoy it. Our story is Nanette's Baguette by Mo Willems. Oh. Nanette, today is a day Nanette won't soon forget. Today in the kitchenette, mom tells Nanette that Nanette gets to get the baguette. There's gonna be a lot of et words in this, can you tell? Baguettes are warm, baguettes smell wonderful. Getting to get the baguette is Nanette's biggest responsibility yet. Is Nanette set to get the baguette? You bet. There she has her money to buy the baguette. The baguette is like a large piece of bread. But on the way, Nanette sees Georgette and Suzette and Brett with his clarinet. Look, there's Mr. Barnett with his pet, Antoinette. Nanette pets Antoinette. Did Nanette forget the baguette? Got a jet, I've got a baguette to get, says Nanette to the quartet. Baker Juliet has met Nanette. She knows it is Nanette's first baguette to get. See, she's at the bakery there. So Juliet gets Nanette the best baguette yet. Nanette, did you get the baguette? You bet, the baguette is warm. The baguette smells wonderful. And there sure is a lot of it. Crack! The baguette is warm. The baguette tastes wonderful. And there still is a lot of it. She's eaten some of it already. Oh my! Crack! The baguette is still warm. The baguette still tastes wonderful. And there is still some of it. Can Nanette stop tasting the baguette? Oh my gosh, look how small it's gotten. Not yet. Crack, 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 crack. Look at all those ways she's eating the baguette. Mmm, baguette. Oh no! There is no more baguette. Nanette begins to fret. Will mom be upset? Will mom regret she let Nanette get the baguette? Kaboom! Now Nanette is wet, wet with no baguette. This is as bad as it can get. Nanette wishes mom had never let Nanette get that baguette. Maybe Nanette will move to Tibet. Wow, that's it. Pretty far away. Tibet is as far away as you can get. Nanette would need a jet. Can Nanette go home instead? Can Nanette face her mom? What will she do? Where is the baguette, Nanette asked mom. Did you forget? Nanette did not forget. Nanette is upset. Nanette is beset with regret. She sweats. <gasps> I ate the baguette. Oh, sweetie, mom hugs Nanette. It is warm, it is wonderful, like a million baguettes. The day's not over yet, Nanette, says mom. Let's reset. Yes, let's. Baker Juliet is surprised to see Nanette, but not too surprised. Nanette's mom gets another baguette. Now they are all set, mom, Nanette, and a baguette. The baguette is warm. The baguette smells wonderful. Uh-oh, what's gonna happen? Crack! Mom! Today is a day Nanette won't soon forget. I hope you enjoyed this story, boys and girls. Bye for now. Thanks, Miss Gerald. All right, now for our final segment, Miss Sinisi is going to share with us an important lesson about the food that we eat. Let's check it out. We're continuing on talking about GMOs. More to know about GMOs. Let's just do a brief review of what we talked about in the other lesson. The brief review of GMOs, it stands for genetically modified organisms, and these are crop 
plants that are created for both human and animal consumption. So today we're gonna to look a little bit about the plants and then we're gonna look about the animal con the com consumption and how that affects the humans. And the plants have been modified in the lab and what they do is they enhance desired traits such as increased resistance to herbicides or improved nutritional content. So the advantages of genetically modified organisms would be pest resistance, herbicide tolerance, disease resistance, um, cold tolerance to the cold temperatures, drought tolerance, uh, a more nutritious plant. We also have pharmaceuticals where they will put edible vaccines in tomatoes or, or potatoes, which would people, people don't consume them. Typically it's livestock that would consume them um, and they can even bring them to people, people that couldn't get a shot that would be able to take a vaccine through eating a genetically modified organism or what are called phytoremediation. And what, what they're doing here is they're using these genetically modified organisms to clean up heavy metal toxins from pollutants in the soil. They can plant those in the soil to help get some different to pull those heavy metals because you don't want heavy metals in your in the soil. Criticisms though, and this is what we want to mainly deal with today, what are the problems with genetically modified organisms? One would be the environmental hazards. Not only do they pose hazards to people, but maybe also to the environment. This example talks about the pollen. We talked about BT corn in a previous video, and what this, this pollen that came from this BT corn caused high mortality rates in monarch butterflies. And it did so not because the butterflies consumed the BT corn, because they consumed milkweed, right? But the wind from the, from the, near the BT corn would blow the pollen over by different areas where the milkweed was into neighboring fields, and then those butterflies would feed on it and it would kill them. So it was very high, a lot of them, mortality, a lot of them died because of this. Um, also reduced effectiveness of pesticides. If we keep generating these genetically modified crops, eventually the pesticides are no longer, um, no longer work as well as they did. They're no longer as effective. We're concerned with insects, that these insects will become resistant to Bt or other crops. So there, it's survival of the fittest. We're gonna look a little bit more at natural selection later. But if you're changing these to make them more insect resistant, the insects need to survive as well. So they're gonna change as well. Um, gene transfer is another um, hazard to non-target species, meaning not the species that we're using. We're, we're ch um, getting these gene transfers in other species. These crop plants are engineered for herbicide tolerance and the weeds will crossbreed, meaning they will breed with other organisms, resulting in the transfer of those herbicide resistant genes from those crops into weeds, creating herbicide tolerant super weeds. So now we've got this overabundance and this overflow of these weeds because they've been transferred, this herbicide from one we didn't intend to put it in, now you've got the weeds running rampant because they're resistant now to these, herb um, these herbicides and now they're super weeds, we can't kill them. We're gonna look at super bugs here in a minute. Um, the second concern are human health risks. The major ones we have are antibiotic resistance, we're gonna look at that, and we're also gonna look at allergenicity, meaning you get allergens through genetics, right? We've changed the nutrition, and we can also form toxins. Some problems stem from the genetic modification techniques. Right? They're not necessarily the genetic modified organism, but how we got that. So let's look a little bit at these techniques, right? genetic engineering techniques. We transfer a single gene from these soil microbes into plants. It's just one gene right, on DNA. However, the higher eukaryotic cells, and we've looked at eukaryotic cells in previous videos, those are cells with a well-defined nucleus. Higher meaning plant cells, animal cells, right? They have shown that genes do not function independently from each other. We can't pull out one gene and it functions just for height. One gene and it functions just for color. One gene and it functions. They all work together. Genes are not static. Rather, they are dynamic and they operate an interactive system. So you may have blue eyes, but you may have 27 genes for blue eyes. You may be six foot tall. You may have 25 genes for height. We can't just take one gene and pull it out and get it to act independently. It doesn't. It has to affect other genes around it. 
And the same goes for proteins, right? Your DNA codes for proteins. We've talked about that before. Proteins don't act independently of one another. They act in tandem in your body. So it can cause damage to some of these proteins. Gene traits work by intercommunication and reciprocity. That means give and take in between genes. Um, one gene may not determine or may determine one trait, but it's not going to deter give you one trait, but it won't determine the, the phenotype, what you see from that trait. That's just a genotypic trait. And in another video, I also talked about genotypes and phenotypes. The gene of interest is inserted into the crop's genome, and what they use is called a vector. A vector is just a way of putting it in to the genome. We have to insert it into something to put it into the genome. The vector though, may contain other elements within the vector. It's not just that gene. In, in, in this vector, we may have antibiotic resistance. We may have what are called marker genes. All of your cells have markers on them. Uh, so of different things, like we talk about, if you look at the AIDS virus, it only targets certain cells that have the markers that then will in turn let those dock onto that cell. So this is what makes you you. So when people go to do, maybe you're going to have a kidney transplant or a lung transplant, and they say you have to find somebody who's a match, that's because you have to have very close very, uh, it has to be someone who usually who's related to you or very similar genes, very similar cells. And these markers is why they give you those anti-rejection drugs because they're trying to fool your cells into accepting a foreign thing. The incorporated genes could reside anywhere on this genome, causing mutations in the host, meaning mutations in the organism we put it in. That's the host, where the vector went. That could change the transgenic crops to produce proteins that are allergic or cause health problems for the people who are ingesting those crops. In addition, there's a concern that the existence of viral promoters in the vectors carrying foreign genes might expose the consumer to viral infections. So we've taken this gene, we put it in the vector. Within that vector, we have something that promotes viruses, virus promoters. We put that into the gene, those are foreign, that's foreign material, and then the person who consumes that may become, um, get those viral infections from the transgenic crops. Genetically modified animals. I said we were gonna talk about both. So first we look at plants, let's look at animals. How are animals genetically modified? They take what's called micro-injection techniques and we're gonna in inject that foreign gene, the DNA from that foreign gene, into the nucleus of fertilized egg cells, zygotes in animals. So you have a fertilized egg, and we'll say a cow, and we're injecting it with this foreign DNA. Then we take that egg, right, and we're gonna put it into the uterus of a female any female, they say they developed into a blastula. This is called gastrulation, and it has to do with how an egg divides. You get a sperm in an egg, and it starts to divide, and then you get four cells, then eight cells, then there are different cells. So once it reaches this stage, then they take it and put it in the uterus of an animal, so that we can get that transgenic organism to develop within that animal. You may be familiar with Dolly the sheep. This is sort of how they got Dolly the sheep. Um, traits that are in, they, what they do, they increase meat quality. Why are we putting these here? We want better meat. We want the quality of meat to be better. Um, they can be improved, um, be improved directly by gene transfer or using growth hormones, vaccines, antibodies, immunity stimulants, and anti-allergy uh, or allergic DNA. And we can produce all those by genetic engineering. We can make the cows grow faster, grow bigger, we get meat that way, we can give them vaccines, we're gonna look at different things. We can stimulate their immunity so that they don't get as many uh, organisms that come down. What are the health risks of these GMOs and these animals? Several animal studies indicate serious health risks associated with GM food, including infertility, because we can pass those hormones on, immune problems, accelerated aging, insulin regulation, and changes in major organs in the GI tract. And the reason we get those in the GI tract is because what are we doing with these organisms? We are eating them. Where do they go immediately? To your GI tract. So it's going to affect that more often than anything else. There are, what are our reasons why genetically modified plants present unique dangers? One, the process of genetic engineering itself creates unpredictable alterations, meaning we can't tell how that's gonna change. 
And that occurs irrespective of which gene is transferred. It doesn't matter which gene we transfer, it, you can still get these unpredictable alterations, meaning they can all change. Mutations in and around the insertion site. So wherever we put that gene into the DNA, we get changes that occur right around where we inserted it. Long after we stop eating this genetically modified crop, its foreign genetically modified proteins may be produced inside our intestines. So we eat it, let's say we stop eating it, well that gives those get into your intestinal cells, and then your cells may continue to produce those proteins, right? Genetically modified diet shows toxic reactions in the digestive tract. So that's why I was just telling you, you're eating these genetically modified organisms and it affects your um, digestive tract you know, not in a good way. The first crop submitted to the FDA's voluntary consultation process was called the flavor saver. They kind of put those two words together tomato, and it showed evidence of toxins. So when people would eat that, they would get toxins into their GI tract. This type of stomach lesions that were created, they were linked to those tomatoes, and they could lead to life-endangering hemorrhage, your bleeding in your intestines, particularly in the elderly, because a lot of those, the elderly eat an aspirin, which thins your blood. And so you're getting these lesions that are toxic. When your blood is thinner, it's easier for you to hemorrhage, right? They take that to prevent blood clots, and a lot of people take it for their heart. Because the GI tract is the first and the largest point of contact with foods, that's where we get these various reactions to toxins. What about allergic reactions? An allergic reaction occurs within the immune system, and what that immune system does, it interprets something as foreign and acts accordingly. That's what your immune system is for. Something comes into your body and they say, this isn't supposed to be here. We're gonna build up antibodies against it. Your white cell count goes up, right? Your helper cells, your B cells, your T cells, things like that. All genetically modified foods, by definition, contain something foreign. So when that enters your body, some of those things your body's going to want to fight off. And several studies show that that provokes an allergic reaction, that you're then in turn, it's called a hypersensitivity reaction against those um, toxins or against those genetically modified organisms. What are the safety aspects of GMO food? All DNA, right, including DNA from GMOs, are composed of the same four nucleotides. We talked about this when DNA, adenine, thymine, cytosine, guanine, all of your DNA are made of the same four nucleotides, whether you're an ant, whether you're a flower, whether you're a dog, whether you're a cat, whether you're a human, it's all the same four nucleotides. That change, that genetic modification, results in what's called a reassortment of sequences of nucleotides. We're switching those base pairs around. We're reassorting them. Kind of like if you would take four balls and put them into a container and shake them up, what are the odds that you would pull them all out in the same order every time? Not very likely. You're going to pull them out, so we're shuffling them. We're mixing those nucleotides. And what that does is it leaves their chemical structures unchanged. So we're looking at their, the, the chemical structures of those um, organisms. Therefore, the DNA from GMOs is chemically equivalent to any other DNA. Meaning, like I just told you, genetically modified or organisms are going to contain any different DNA than you already have. They're just in different order, right? So more research needs to be done on the effects of DNA, of that DNA, from the GMOs on humans. So all of the research that I did kept saying, we don't have enough studies, we need to do further studies, we have to find out about these things. The last thing I wanted to look at was a little bit along the same lines as GMOs, but another problem that we have are, are antibiotics in animal food. And this means the food the animal eats, and what happens when we give them those antibiotics. We have an overuse, meaning we use them too much, or a misuse, we use them for the wrong thing, of antibiotics in the meat industry for contributing to the rise in what are called antibiotic resistant uh, organisms. We'll look at those. In the US and across the world, everywhere that this happens. It is estimated that this is going to kill about 10 million people a year worldwide by 2050. From not from eating this meat, but from the antibiotic resistance that occurs as a result of it. So in the U.S., antibiotic-resistant infections cause over 2 million illnesses and 23,000 deaths each year. 
These are the antibiotic resistant infections that you get. Let's look at how that happens. The majority of antibiotics in the US are given to animals that are not sick. So you go to the doctor, you have an infection, right, a bacterial infection, they give you an antibiotic to kill the bacteria. These animals aren't sick. So they're giving them these antibiotics and then they're mixed into their food and their water to make uh, them grow bigger and to prevent illness because they're all cramped in these unhealthy conditions. You may not, they may be, um, you know, sort of like a slaughterhouse when you see them, the dirty conditions or the chicken coops with all the chickens in there in the dark and things like that. So the antibiotic resistance occurs when an antibiotic loses its ability to effectively control or kill the bacteria. Resistant. So you take the drug that you need to help your bacterial infection, but it doesn't work. That what happened was that bacteria is resistant to that drug. And that's, what, um, that's how you get MERS, right? That's what MERS is. You go to the hospital. It's methacycline uh, resistant antibiotic, you know, Staphylococcus aureus, MRSA, right? Methacycline, yes, that's what it is. And so that's, it's resistant to that antibiotic. It won't work to kill it. So now we have to find something else to kill it. These bacteria will continue to grow in the presence of therapeutic levels of antibiotic. Therapeutic meaning what they give you to get rid of it. So it's not going to kill them. They're just going to keep growing and growing. These resistant microbes may require other medications or higher doses more often with more side effects. So you're getting more adverse side effects because you have to take a higher dose, you know, maybe four times a day to get rid of your bacterial infection. Some infections become completely untreatable. Those are called superbugs. And a lot of people will get these and it kills them because we don't have any antibiotics to fight the superbugs because they're so resistant to any antibiotic treatments. So in 2011, livestock in the US consumed 80% of all antibiotics sold. That's a huge percentage. So you have all of this livestock out there with these antibiotics then that we get a resistance in infections, and so now we can no longer treat the infections and humans are dying because these bugs have taken over where they can't, you can't kill them. How does the meat industry use these antibiotics? We looked a little bit about it. They want to make those animals grow at faster rates. Because why? Money, right? The faster it grows, the better, more you can slaughter it, the bigger it is, and the more money that you get. Also to prevent illnesses or to control the spread of illness in unhealthy, confined living conditions, we looked at that, or to treat diseases. <clears throat> Antibiotic resistance arises as a result of natural selection. We talked about that a little bit in the BT corn and the monarch butterflies. You have all these antibiotics and the bacteria don't want to die either. Anything that's alive doesn't want to die. So we have natural selection, meaning survival of the fittest. That bacteria is going to change to avoid being killed by this antibiotic. That's natural selection. So only the strongest will survive. Only those that have the most resistance are going to live. Thanks, Ms. Sinisi. All right, well, that wraps up everything for us here today on Education Station. We want to thank everyone who shared their awesome lessons. And we want to thank you for watching. We'll see you next time right here on Education Station.